Tonight, a special edition of the Evening News from Baltimore, where Nora O'Donnell reports on the search for the missing after a bridge collapse. What caused a ship to crash into the bridge? What investigators have discovered so far? Tonight on the CBS Evening News. It's going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way. To our first responders, today and always, we just want to say from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. This is an excruciating day for several families who went to bed last night, uh, having it be a normal night, and woke up today to news that no one wants to receive. Hello, I'm Robert Costa in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. We're following breaking news out of Baltimore. Officials now say rescue workers are still searching for multiple people who are unaccounted for after a bridge collapse. A container ship struck a support column of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, a major thoroughfare around Baltimore, at around 1.30 a.m. Eastern. A large portion of the span then fell down, sending vehicles and people into the water. And this is still very much an active search and rescue mission. And there is not a single resource that we will hold off on deploying. I have already authorized the deployment of everything from air, land, and sea resources to make sure that this search and rescue operation is carried out to its fullest intent. Nicole Skanga has been following this story for us all day in Maryland. Nicole, great to have you with us. You have some new reporting about what happened on the ship in the minutes before the bridge was hit. What can you tell us? Yeah, I want to outline a few things, uh, Robert. Good to be with you. First and foremost, I just heard from the Baltimore County Executive. He told me that roughly two minutes elapsed between when the pilot and crew first notified Maryland authorities that something was wrong with the cargo container ship Dolly and when that collision occurred at approximately 1.30 a.m. That is how quickly local law enforcement here had to jump into action in order to close down traffic to and from the bridge. We're also learning uh, from local and federal law enforcement officials that the tugs on the dolly were loose prior uh, to the collision that occurred, uh, that it is standard operating procedure for the tugs to escort uh, these large container ships out of the port, out of their docking station, but that it is not required for an escort to be there uh, when, when going under the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And so an important note there and also key for law enforcement uh, in the coming days and specifically the NTS which has launched its independent investigation of this, is getting on board the ship. They were not able, NTSB, to get on the ship today to get those recorders to determine at what time did the power go off, at what time uh, did the ship's controls really get out of whack here. I was told by law enforcement, uh, by internal briefing papers, that uh, there were alarms that rang out aboard the dolly, uh, that the pilot and crews really had seconds to run a few system checks and that it was at that moment that the system checks failed that they reached out and notified Maryland authorities also trying. We lost audio with uh, our correspondent Nicole Skanga. She did speak uh, with the Baltimore mayor. Uh, let's listen to part of that for a moment. I just want to ask you about your message to the city of Baltimore in the coming days. Obviously, a terrible tragedy. Um, and if you can also just speak to that May Day moment. When you think about those law enforcement uh, folks who were able and personnel who were able to shut down the bridge to prevent more cars from going on, we know that they save lives and are heroes uh, for doing so. Uh, but for our city and our state, uh, the message is very clear. Nothing can break the spirit of Baltimore. Our correspondent, Nicole Skanga, talking with Baltimore's mayor as this story continues to unfold at a local level. It's also unfolding at a national level, quite a national story. At the same time, our White House correspondent, Ed O'Keefe, senior political correspondent, joins us now from the White House. Ed, tell us more about how President Biden is handling this. Bob, he was informed early this morning and had 
spend a, most of the morning with top aides who uh, deal with these kinds of local and state issues across the country to get a handle on it. Spoke with the governor, the mayor, and other officials. And before leaving for a series of events in North Carolina this afternoon, made clear that it's his intention to see the federal government pay for the reconstruction and the cleanup from the collapse of this bridge. Uh, that will leave a lot of questions as to how exactly he can say that that should happen and how exactly it would be paid for. And then the same expression of sentiment about who would pay for this, he said, I hope Congress will work with me on it. So in essence, he's signaling it's going to require some kind of legislation or at least authorization from Congress working with him to make this happen. Appreciate that for the second time now in two weeks, a bridge feeding the Interstate 95 corridor along the East Coast has either dropped into the water or been condemned and is no longer usable. And this is a president, the other one being uh, right there in Providence, Rhode Island, where they've discovered that an ongoing reconstruction project has to be scrapped entirely and restarted. And it's the third incident now along the I-95 corridor in the last year, the other one being uh, the partial bridge collapse in Philadelphia due to a tanker fire last year. This is a president who, of course, has put so much of his legacy on the line in terms of infrastructure and rebuilding the country and creating jobs and demonstrating that government can do big things and use its spending power to make it happen. So here at the White House, at least, this is now seen as a great opportunity or challenge that has to be met to prove yet again to an increasingly skeptical public that the government can step up and solve a problem that's been created by an unforeseen disaster, as we've seen there in Baltimore. And so you can expect that here at the White House in the coming weeks and months, if not years, the president's going to be keenly concerned about the reconstruction of this bridge in a city he knows well because he's gone to and from it and through it throughout his career uh, as, as, a, as a senator from uh, neighboring Delaware and then as vice president and president. We were with him last year or in 2022 when he visited the Port of Baltimore to make infrastructure announcements. He's keenly aware and sensitive to this kind of disaster and what it's going to do to such an important East Coast port city. Ed O'Keefe on the personal impact as well as the political outlook with President Biden as he evaluates this unfolding disaster in Baltimore. Ed, stick with us. We have our correspondent on the ground in Maryland, Nicole Skanga, back with us. Nicole, you are tracking the impact this has not only on the national level as, as it plays out in Congress perhaps in the next few weeks, but what it really means for people in the immediate aftermath. What are you learning? Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, I've heard community members call the bridge a symbol, a landmark, a hallmark of the city. We heard Secretary Buttigieg call it a cathedral of American infrastructure. It's also economically so significant, the second busiest port on the eastern seaboard in 2023, responsible for 52.3 million tons of foreign cargo worth $80 billion, 30,000 vehicles a day. Across the bridge. That's a whopping 11.5 million in the course of a year. But just talking to people here on the ground who have come down to take a look at the bridge, they can't believe what they're seeing. We spoke with one individual who works at the port. His name's John Zafia. Take a listen. I was walking the dog last night around 1.30. I heard this loud boom. And they really didn't, you know, I thought maybe it was an accident, but nothing to this. <laughs> capacity. That's going to affect all of our work down there. You can't get any ships in or out. And that's investment on the community level and, of course, investment on the federal level, as we heard today from officials, all the way up to the president vowing that every penny that the city of Baltimore needs in its rebuilding will be given uh, to the city. And, and I asked Senator Cardin earlier today uh, what the financial impact will be. He said, we're not even there yet. I can't even give you uh, a, a dollar or a price yet, even a ballpark, uh, a, a ballpark figure, Robert. Nicole, you've been doing terrific work. I know you were up early in Maryland on CBS Mornings working all day. We'll let you get back to your reporting, but thank you for joining us here on America Decides. Ed O'Keefe is still with us at the White House. Ed, this is the story of the day. There's no doubt about it. But President Biden and Vice President Harris continue to campaign as the 2024 race heats up. What's what are you watching on that front amid everything in Baltimore? The two of them don't campaign together that often, Bob. And they went today to Raleigh, North Carolina, to appear with that state's uh, term limited Governor Roy Cooper and the guy they'd like to see succeed in the Democrat 
uh, Democratic Attorney General. A and North Carolina is a state that Democrats continue to believe could be gettable for them in an environment where the Republican Party has now nominated a rather conservative candidate to run for governor uh, and in a state that Donald Trump won by just small single digits. They believe it's flippable in a year where the former president continues to face legal issues and issues like access to abortion, services, health care, costs, democracy concerns are on the ballot in a state that is changing much like Georgia is and other parts of the South. So the fact that they both went together and tonight are appearing at a fundraiser in that state is a signal of how seriously they're taking it. Remember, we talk about roughly seven battleground states around the country. Some maybe only talk about six. The Biden campaign wants to make North Carolina the seventh. And the visit that they're making today is a good example of the kinds of visits that they will continue to make and the kind of money and attention they'll continue to invest in, in the state, especially if places like Georgia increasingly appear to be out of their reach, just given the changing politics of that battleground state. Ed O'Keefe, thank you very much. Next, we're joined by Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen to discuss the latest on the state and federal response efforts. You're streaming America Decides. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. If China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? Here in Tel Aviv, second siren in about 10 minutes. This Humvee just pulled up and said, it's time to leave. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To so land this power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression. Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. Record-breaking storm surge and devastating wind. Every second counts. The mud punched a hole right through the wall. See, hear, feel the forecast. Tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Stories that inform. Or you can be really old at 60, and you can be really young at 85. Inspire. How do we unlock the power within ourselves to be who we want to be and brighten your day the best part of fame is making people feel good always send the people home happy make every day a little more like sunday morning
Here Comes the Sun. Stream now on the free CBS News app. Welcome back to America Decides. We are following the latest developments in the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. We're joined now by Maryland Democratic Senator Chris Van Hollen. Senator, our thoughts are with everyone in Maryland in your state uh, this afternoon and evening. Uh, let's begin, sir, with where this federal response could begin. Uh, you have served Maryland for many years. What is needed at this time, knowing that it's still an unfolding situation? Well, you're right. First and foremost, our thoughts are with the, the families of the six um, missing individuals who are on the bridge and the search and rescue mission uh, continues. Uh, we are, of course, uh, looking at the longer term impact. I was pleased to talk to uh, President Biden earlier today before he spoke to the nation, and he has pledged the full support of the federal government, and we'll work with our colleagues in Congress to do that. So it means, first and foremost, helping to clear the channel under this bridge. Uh, the Port of Baltimore is a thriving port. We are the busiest port when it comes to roll-on, roll-off automobiles. Uh, and so lots of jobs connected with the livelihood of the port. We need to get that channel cleared. And then, of course, um, replacing uh, the bridge will come next. And we're going to have to work very hard uh, to get those resources uh, put together to, to do the job. We saw after the I-95 disaster in Pennsylvania, Governor Shapiro there worked very quickly with state and local and federal authorities to try to get something to happen. You know Maryland and federal politics as well as anyone. What really needs to happen now to make that timeline shorter in terms of rebuilding the bridge? Well, there, there are two things. First, um, we want to quickly access uh, what's called the Federal Emergency Relief Fund. This is a fund within the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, the state of Maryland will quickly submit its proposal, and uh, we expect fast action on that. Uh, and then we will work uh, in, in Congress for the longer-term funding piece uh, for the bridge. Um, we need to do an assessment and timeline. It will take time, uh, and it will be expensive. Um, in the meantime, uh, we do want to focus on clearing that port channel. Um, thousands of jobs uh, are immediately at stake and thousands more with the ripple effect of, of the economy of the Port of Baltimore. And it's up and down uh, the East Coast. So number one, search and rescue. Number two, clear the channel, reopen the port. Number three, uh, rebuild the bridge. You spoke with President Biden today, but if you had a chance to have a conversation with Speaker Johnson, the Republican leader in the House, what would you tell him about what needs to happen now? I would say, Speaker Johnson, this is a time when everybody needs to come together, Republicans or Democrats, a party label doesn't matter. Uh, this is a national emergency. Uh, when we have national emergencies in America, we need to come together and stick together and get the job done. Uh, I did talk to Senator Schumer earlier today, so I know that the Senate uh, is absolutely committed to getting the job done. Uh, I do look forward to reaching out to Speaker Johnson and hope that he will join us um, as a fellow American in this effort. Is there any discussion at this point with the president or Leader Schumer about the number that's going to be required, at, le at least on the congressional level, in terms of funding to make this project, this rebuilding, happen? It's too early to put a specific price tag on, on what this will cost um, in terms of the bridge uh, replacement. Uh, I do know that as we speak, the president has ordered the Army Corps uh, to deploy uh, right now to help with the clearing uh, under, the, under the bridge to open that uh, shipping channel. I believe we'll also have some U.S. Navy assets uh, deployed to help with that uh, effort. Uh, the Coast Guard is here as we speak. Uh, as part of the search and rescue operation. So the federal government is a full partner uh, with the city of Baltimore and the mayor of Baltimore and with Maryland and our governor. Our focus, of course, today, as it should be, is on those affected directly, the families. But when you step back, help us understand as someone who knows Maryland, what could the potential economic cost be of having this bridge down? Oh, it's a, it, 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 so there are two pieces to this, uh, Robert. One is the, the bridge itself. It's about 35,000 people a day uh, cross this bridge, and uh, they will be diverted at least temporarily to, to other ways to get to and from um, the city of Baltimore. 
that will have an impact. But the larger economic impact, um, at least in the, the coming months, uh, will be that port of Baltimore. Uh, as long as ships cannot get in and out, um, it will have a harmful impact on, on jobs there. Just the workers' salaries and wages on a one-day basis is $2 million. Uh, there are thousands of jobs directly um, connected with the, the port, and then tens of thousands more when you think of the whole uh, sort of ecosystem uh, for, the, for the port of Baltimore. So that will be a priority in terms of the economic impact. The bridge rebuilding, of course, is essential uh, to getting people uh, you know, to and from places more easily. But in terms of the economic impact on people's livelihoods, uh, it's really clearing, clearing this channel, uh, getting the, the, the ship you know, moved aside, whatever necessary, uh, so that the ships that are currently in the Port of Baltimore, and I think there are about four of them, um, can get out. And there are about 20 ships that had been waiting to get into the Port of Baltimore uh, that will have to be diverted elsewhere. But that gives you an idea of just how busy a port this is. And we need to make sure we get it up and running again as soon as possible. Has anyone told you as the United States senator when this could happen, when the port could reopen to have that free flow of commercial ships? We, we don't know because uh, we have to assess exactly, you know, what what the debris situation is from the ship that is literally under the bridge right now. Um, and uh, we've got to make sure that that channel is cleared. But it is absolutely um, a priority. Search and rescue mission, of course, comes first. Uh, but then they are going to be looking um, at the at the next steps. The Army Corps. Uh, was around the, the briefing table that we had. They're ready to go, uh, as are all the other federal assets that the president has ordered deployed. That's on top of the city uh, and state efforts as well. Senator Chris Van Hollen, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. The Supreme Court is weighing access to a widely used abortion pill. Coming up next, we'll analyze today's oral arguments from the high court, and we'll go to a key battleground state where the Biden campaign is rallying on this issue of reproductive rights, your streaming America decides. On our places, right shiny faces. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen because nothing ever happens in East Palestine, but it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. President, please evacuate. Cute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original. 48 hours. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS.
sightseers in space, the thrill of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you have one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Welcome back to America Decides. Today, the Supreme Court did hear arguments about restricting access to the widely used abortion pill mifepristone. And some of the justices who voted to overturn Roe v. Wade challenged those opposing the FDA's actions to broaden access to the pill. Joining us now, CBS News' is Shauna Mizell and Aaron Navarro. Shauna was inside the Supreme Court during the arguments, and Aaron is following President Biden in North Carolina. Shauna, let's begin with you. Thanks for being here. A busy day at the court. Reproductive rights at the fore of the national political discussion and, of course, the legal front. What are you learning about how those who support abortion rights are reacting to what happened at the court today? So I, I had the opportunity to interview the president of Planned Parenthood, Alexis McGill Johnson, right after those oral arguments. And she expressed a little bit of confidence, but I want to toss to that sound and play a little bit of that interview. I did feel good, right? I did feel like that, you know, obviously standing is a cornerstone of American jurisprudence. And so they were really struggling with that question to find a harm and to really question, I think, whether or not the remedy was was overly broad that they were uh, they were arguing for on the plaintiff side. It did feel good that they had kind of gotten that logic and they were really willing to dismiss that. I say that and then I also say this is the same court that gave us Dobbs. So, Bob, confidence with the caveat, obviously highlighting that these are the same justices that, you know, determined that Dobbs decision overturning Roe versus Wade. And what were your impressions, Shauna, from that conversation, but as well as being there at the court? Being in the room, you had Justice Amy Coney Barrett really honing in on the standing that they were seeking to bring this case on. Were these doctors able to cite any specific examples of harm? And they really weren't able to. So a lot of these arguments today focused on standing. They really didn't even get to the merits of the argument, whether the FDA acted correctly in rolling back those regulations. As this was playing out here in Washington, Aaron, you've been with President Biden, covering him on the campaign trail. How are voters responding to his message on abortion rights, as well as to his campaign more broadly? Well, it's a key issue. And just from talking to the voters that attended this White House official side event, marked as uh, remarks about health care, about the Affordable Care Act, I asked them about North Carolina. This is a state that Biden, that Democrats are looking to play in. It's a state that Trump won by just over one percentage point in 2020. Take a listen to what these voters had to tell me. Do you think there's enough Democratic energy here in North Carolina right now for him to win? For I absolutely think there is, especially, um, so I came from California. I moved to North Carolina three years ago, and there has been a large influx of folks moving from states like New York, California, and sometimes that does bring Democratic energy with it. Um, it remains to be seen whether those folks will re-register in North Carolina. Now, this is what Democrats are leaning on, this newer population, people moving in from more Democratic-leaning states. And it's a reason why the Biden-Harris campaign has lumped in North Carolina into their battlegrounds of the South, along with Georgia. Aaron, stay with us. Shauna, when you step back and look at the issue of abortion rights, you cover this not just here in Washington, but across the campaign trail. How is it going to play out, especially with the Mifepristone issue in some of these key states? Well, I think the Biden-Harris campaign is really hinging on this issue across the United States as they look ahead to the November election. If you look at the states they've been campaigning in, including Arizona, where abortion could be on the ballot, it's a state that you saw the vice president as well as the president visit just in recent weeks. And so they really are seeking to amplify this issue. But on a press call with reporters yesterday, Biden campaign manager Julie Chavez Rodriguez actually said that they aren't really thinking that this Mifa Pristone case is something that will enhance the conversation surrounding abortion, but they feel a responsibility to elevate this conversation as this case goes on. And Aaron, on abortion rights, how are Republicans in your orbit in terms of reporting in North Carolina and elsewhere handling this issue? Well, they're being uh, they're walking the line on it. And it's still an open question on whether Republicans support a 15 week ban. We've heard Trump talk about how he wants to find a compromise. 
And we've seen Democrats in the Biden-Harris campaign say there's no room for compromise when it comes to a national abortion ban. So Republicans are still figuring out their message a little bit. That's why we haven't seen Mark Robinson, the controversial gubernatorial candidate here in North Carolina, speak about it much since clinching the nomination, knowing that he does have to appeal to those moderate suburban voters. Shauna Mizell, Aaron Navarro on the road. Thank you so much for your reporting. And that does it for us today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides at 5 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America 